Now, he read out of Matthew 12, and uh, we're going to read out of Luke 11. And would you turn there, go ahead and stand and honor God who gave us his word. We'll be in verse 29 through 36. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar nor under a basket, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. You may be seated. We're asking God, join me, and we're asking God to add his blessing to the reading, the understanding, the living of his holy and precious word. All right. Well, Jesus is picking up where he left off last week. If you were here and you heard the message last week, we know in verse 14 and 16. Let's go back to Luke 11, 14 and 16. <clears throat> There's a crowd gathering. In this crowd, perhaps some were genuine seekers, but Jesus did not assume that just because there was a packed house that everyone was there for a good and noble reason. In fact, verse 16, others to test him were demanding a sign from heaven. That little word demanding is, is key there, and that little word testing. So Jesus knows the heart of men, women, boys, and girls, and he continued to show them, because now in verse 29, the crowd was increasing, and he's going to pick up where he left off. He's going to show them that he is not a dog who will bark on demand. We talked last week, I just want to briefly say this, that again, Jesus knows our hearts. And when we search through the scriptures, uh, we see that there were times when he did give signs to substantiate his message. There were, there were genuine seekers who would say, we know that you are who you say you are because of the signs that you give us. Now, they, they never were to replace the gospel but they supplemented the gospel when there was a genuine seeker. And so to quote again from Dr. Wayne Grudem, he says, this rebuke against signs is, rep is repeated elsewhere in the gospels, but it is important to note that rebukes against signs were always directed against hostile unbelievers who were seeking or demanding a miracle only as an opportunity to criticize Jesus. Never does Jesus rebuke anyone who comes in faith or in need, seeking healing or deliverance or any other kind of miracle, whether for himself or herself or for others. There is nothing, Grudem continues, there's nothing inappropriate in seeking miracles for the purposes for which they are given, to confirm the truthfulness of the gospel, to bring help to those in need, to remove hindrances from ministry, and ultimately to bring glory to God. So I'm stressing here that Jesus was agitated. He calls them wicked 
not merely because they were asking for a sign, but because their heart was hard. They were testing him. They were demanding him. And nowhere in the scripture does Jesus respond positively to one testing him or demanding that he perform by our timetable. So Jesus tells them that he will give a final sign, a greater sign than he has ever given. And it's not just for them, and it's certainly not because they snapped their fingers and said, jump. But Jesus would graciously give this sign, not because anyone deserved it or demanded it. And he wouldn't give it merely to them, but he would give it as a sign to the whole world. And it is the sign of Jonah that Adam spoke of. The resurrection of Christ from the grave. Matthew 12, 39 through 40 spells this out for us. Now, as far as the three days and three nights, listen to what MacArthur says on this. He says, three days and three nights was an emphatic Hebrew way of saying three days, any part of the day, day or night. And by Jewish reckoning, this would be an apt way of expressing a period of time that includes parts of three days. Thus, Christ was crucified on Friday. His resurrection occurred on the first day of the week, Sunday. And by Hebrew reckoning, this would qualify as three days and three nights. All sorts of elaborate schemes have been devised to suggest that Christ might have died on Wednesday or Thursday just to accommodate the extreme literal meaning of these words. But the original meaning and the original audience would not have required this sort of wooden interpretation. But let's go back to, to this group. The crowd is, is gathering, it's, it's increasing, and Jesus calls this crowd wicked. Look at verse 29 with me. As the crowd was increasing, he began to say this this uh, idea of he began to say means that he said it over and over and over. This wasn't a one-time rebuke. This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. Now, it's interesting that he calls this group wicked. This group consisted of scribes and Pharisees. And he, so he was not speaking to Gentiles, which we normally would associate with wickedness, idol worshiping Gentiles, godless lawbreakers. There were some very religious people in the crowd. And yet Jesus chooses to use this phrase, you wicked generation. There's more than one kind of wickedness. There's the wickedness of morality there's the wickedness of idolatry, and then there's wickedness that would dare to look into the face of truth and say, we need more. We demand more. Listen to, again, Dr. John MacArthur. He says, amazingly, the reason Jesus gave for calling this generation wicked was not any of its thoughts, not that any of its thoughts and outward lifestyle uh, was vile, but because it demanded a sign. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with this request, certainly not enough to qualify that those making it as, would be called wicked and deserving of divine judgment. But upon further inspection, by demanding a sign from Jesus, they were claiming that Jesus was to blame for their rejection because he had not given them adequate evidence. That, in their minds, justified their conclusion that he was indeed a servant of Satan last week, not of God. So the most wicked thing a person could do is to look into the face of truth and say, no, I don't have enough evidence. I demand more evidence, and then I will believe. Jesus knew that a hundred 
signs, a hundred miracles would not have swayed their hearts. They were only testing him and demanding so that they could criticize. And again, Jesus tells them that he will give a final sign, but not because they deserve it, not because they demand it, but out of grace. And it would be the sign of his resurrection. Now, Jesus is going to tell us that two groups of people will be present at the judgment to write, to, to raise up and condemn this group that should have seen. And in light of the amount of evidence that they had seen, they should have repented and believed, but they didn't. He says two groups. Number one, the Ninevites, the Ninevites who had believed and who had repented during Jonah's missionary trip, as well as the queen of Sheba, we'll get to that in a minute, who believed through Solomon's message, these two groups will stand up and accuse this group of unbelievers and condemn them. Now, don't miss this. Jesus is stating emphatically that there is life after death. Jesus is stating emphatically that there is judgment after death, that there is heaven and hell after death. These people were long dead and gone. The Ninevites who believed and repented. Queen, the Queen Sheba, she had, uh, she had died long ago, and yet she will be, they will be present at the judgment day to say, we repented and believed and we had far less evidence than you have. So listen up. There's three commands in this section. I want you to circle these or put a dot beside these. That's, when I'm reading through my Bible, I look through the Bible to see what, what are the commands. I want to make sure that after I've read my Bible, I'm not just smarter, more educated, but that I'm actually reading my Bible to obey what God has told me. There's three imperative commands in this section. Verse 31, behold, you might not think of that as a, as a call to action, but it is, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Verse 32, behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Circle those two words, behold and behold. And in verse 35, watch out or literally make sure that you keep your eye clean. So those are three commands that we're going to explore this morning. Let's go first to Jonah. How is Jesus like Jonah? Jonah. How is Jesus not like Jonah? How is Jesus greater than Jonah? How is Jesus the greater candy cane and not the small one? Well, there are many ways, and, and I encourage you to go back and read those four chapters of the book of Jonah. Very interesting book. One of my favorites. There are many ways that Jesus and Jonah are similar. Listen, they were both preachers. They were both missionaries. They both preached repentance. They both had fruitful ministries. Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish and was raised as a sign and then preached repentance. Jesus would spend three days in the grave and be raised as a sign. In fact, his greatest sign. But that's where the similarities end. Jonah had his own sin from which to repent. The fact that he wrote the book of Jonah and included all of his warts and blemishes, that gives me hope that he did in fact repent. If you go and read through that book, you might scratch your head and say, am I going to see Jonah in heaven? I don't know 100%, but... Wouldn't it be a, a shame if Jonah didn't make it to heaven, but the Ninevites to whom he preached and said, repent, they made it to heaven. We know they did. They'll be at the judgment to say, hey, scribes, Pharisees, we had far less evidence, but yet we repented and believed. 
Dr. Mark Dever says the fact that Jonah wrote the book as he wrote it gives him hope that Jonah did repent before he died. So Jonah had his own sin from which to repent. Jesus was and is sinless. Under Jonah's preaching, the Ninevites turned from God's wrath and turned to the Savior. Jesus is the Savior that they turned to. Unbelievably, Jonah was unhappy that Nineveh repented, was not destroyed, was saved. That's one of the difficulties in reading that book. But Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus delighted to do his Father's will, every bit of it. Jesus rejoiced when one lost sheep was found. Jonah died and his bones are still in his tomb. Mosul, Iraq, people go there all the time to pay homage to Jonah the prophet. Jesus' tomb is empty. Something greater than Jonah is here indeed, Jesus is saying. Now, this is good news. The death of Christ would show that God's justice demanded a perfect and divine sacrifice for sins. But the resurrection of Christ would show that God the Father accepted Christ's sacrifice and that all who repent and believe in Christ will be forgiven, will be saved. This is good news. Unless you reject Christ. If someone rejects Christ, especially someone who has been given the privileges that this crowd has been given. When others had accepted him with far less light and revelation, then their condemnation will be great. It will be severe. Indeed, Jesus says that the Ninevites, again, those that had repented and believed when Jonah came to town and preached, they will rise up and accuse and condemn this group at the day of judgment. By the way, this group that was saying, hey, show us a sign and we'll believe. Turn with me to Matthew 28 for a moment. Verse 11 through 15. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is even to this day. So this group that said, oh, give us a sign so that we'll believe. Jesus said, I'll give you a sign that's so great that you wouldn't believe it if it weren't true. And in light of the fact that they knew he was dead and they knew he had left the tomb, they couldn't explain it, but rather than repent and say, dear God, we've been wrong all this time, they concocted this story that the disciples had stolen the body. Jesus was right after all. Imagine that. He knew there's no sign. There's no sign. There's no amount of signs that will win you over. Listen to what Kent Hughes says. He says, what about us today? We must not try to escape the weight of these words. 
that the Ninevites will accuse this group, will condemn them. He says, our advantage is immense. We have explicit accounts of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, not from one, not from two, not from three, but from four evangelists. We have Paul's letters, Peter's letters, John's letters. We have the whole of Scripture. We have the reasoning and the living of 2,000 years of church history. We have the Holy Spirit's work around us and in us. How great our responsibility to be open to the light that God has poured into us, to believe in Jesus Christ and to follow him faithfully and courageously. So again, I want to direct you to this command, verse 32. Behold, something greater than Jonah is here. You say, how is that a command for me? What God is saying is, you have 66 books to explore how great Christ is. Dig in. This word behold means to look with laser focus, to dig, to research, to explore. So God is commanding us today, church. Try your best. Exhaust yourself exploring the inexhaustible Christ and what great resources he has given us. We have far more than the scribes and the Pharisees had. And they had more than the Ninevites had. So with great privilege comes great responsibility. I implore you, behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And then he switches gears and he talks about Solomon and the queen of Sheba. If you would, please turn to 1 Kings chapter 10. I encourage you to read that whole chapter, but I'm just going to pick up in verses 6 through 10. So Queen Sheba, the queen of Sheba, rather, you know, she, she traveled about a thousand miles, brought many gifts to behold Solomon and his wisdom and his riches Let's, let's pick up on this dialogue here between the queen of Sheba and Solomon. Then she said to the king, it was a true, verse six. Then she said to the king, it was a true report, which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half of it was not told to me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I had heard. How blessed are your men. How blessed are these, your servants, who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Look at verse 9. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness Verse 10, she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great amount of spices and precious stones. Never again did such abundance of spices come in as that which the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. Well, we know that she may have come to see how great Solomon was, but she left knowing how great Solomon's God was. And we know that she, Jesus said it himself, she will be on the favorable side of the judgment seat of Christ to point to these scribes and Pharisees and say, what I saw blew me away, but what you had at your disposal blew that away. And I believed I was saved you're rejected. Your condemnation will be great. John MacArthur says this. The 
These people in Jesus' day were invited to come to Jesus day after day to sit at his feet and listen. And there is no indication that the queen of Sheba was invited to visit Solomon. Yet she was saved from her sin after believing that Sol- believing what Solomon told her about the true and living God while they rejected salvation, the truth from the king infinitely wiser than the great Solomon. That is the damning indictment of that wicked generation. So again, as we compared and contrasted Jonah with Jesus, let's do that for a moment with Solomon because verse 31, behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon and Jesus were both sons of David, both kings, both incredibly wise. Sometimes Solomon used his wisdom and his power for godly purposes. But many times he did not. Jesus is not only wise, but the Bible says that he is wisdom itself. And as such, Jesus, the wise king, always acted wisely. He never abused his wisdom. He never abused his power. He never acted or lived in ways that were contrary to his holy, wise, powerful nature. Jesus is great David's greater son. So if the queen of Sheba was blown away, and literally it says that her breath was stolen from her. Translation, she had her breath taken from her. She was speechless. If she was blown away by Solomon and the dim light that Solomon shone on the face of God, how much more should it have taken the breath away of these scribes and Pharisees, this crowd, who were standing in the very presence of God himself, Jesus Christ, Solomon's God, Solomon's Savior. Jesus is the wisest, the best, the richest, most powerful king ever. Therefore, rejection in his face would be severely punished. Are you picking up on this? We have some candles here. Uh, The scribes and the Pharisees, they could read Christ by the light of a candle. And it was great. It was far more than the Queen of Sheba had. It was far more than the Ninevites had. But you and I, we have been blessed and we are seeing the person and the work of Christ in the light of the noonday sun. And again, we see this phrase, behold, something greater than Solomon is here. This is a commandment. May may not seem that way to us in the English. But no word is wasted in the Scripture. And God is telling us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, behold Jesus Look at him, study him, research him, exhaust yourself on the inexhaustible Christ. They had such little and were held to such a high standard. How much higher a standard will we be held? Jesus is saying no amount of effort is too great to understand how great I am. I know we've got a group that drives about 45 minutes to church. Did you have to come a thousand miles? The Queen of Sheba did. And Jesus is saying that wasn't too far of a, I'd say drive, but they didn't have cars back then. That wasn't too far of a camel's ride or whatever the the chariot would have been pulled with. No amount of effort, no amount of distance is too far to see and savor Jesus Christ. 
Listen to what Dr. Stephen Cole says, again, applying this to you and to me. He says, will the queen of Sheba rise up and condemn us at the day of judgment? We have the completed canon of God's holy word in our own language. Men like Wycliffe and Tyndall, they have suffered much persecution, giving us the Bible in English. There are still many people groups around the world who do not have even one book of the Bible in their own language. Do we read God's word? Do we meditate on it daily? Can we truly say with the psalmist, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces? Psalm 119, verse 72. I don't know if you are aware, Donald Whitney, uh, Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Life. I believe he's still a professor at Southern. He teaches devotions and, and just being in the word and uh, disciplining yourself for God's word it, or discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And he, he gives this illustration. There was a man in Kansas City who had been severely injured by an explosion. Now listen, it's a little graphic, but it paints a, a very powerful picture. He had lost his eyesight. He had lost both hands. He had just become a Christian when this explosion had happened. And one of his deepest regrets was, how am I going to read the Bible now? I don't have hands. I don't have eyesight. His hearing was damaged. He heard of a lady in England who read Braille with her lips. And that excited him. So he, he began to, to attempt this. What he found is that the nerve endings on his lips were also damaged. So he had no feeling on his lips. One day as he brought one of the braille pages to his lips, his tongue happened to touch a few of the raised characters. And he could feel it. In a flash, he thought, I can read the Bible using my tongue. What is our excuse of saying, yes, God, we believe this is your word, but we're not in it daily. We're not meditating on it. We are not exhausting ourselves, exploring the inexhaustible Christ. I read another illustration this week. I shared it in Sunday school, but some of you weren't able to hear it. There was a mom and her five-year-old, and they were in church, and uh, the child began to weep loudly, and the mother scolded the child. Be quiet. You're disrupting the worship service. The child continued to weep. It says, didn't you hear me? You're disrupting the worship service, and why are you crying anyway? And the five-year-old looked into his mom's eyes and said, didn't you hear what the preacher said? They beat Jesus and they killed him. Of course, the mother had heard that. But she had grown desensitized to that. You know, sure, sure, Jesus came. Yes, that's what he died. Yay. Guys, we have to fight, don't we? Not just to stay in the Bible but we have to pray that God would keep our hearts tender to the very truths of Scripture. Now, verses 33 through 36, Jesus, this is not a new section of Scripture. He's explaining what he just taught. The pro and I would sum it up like this. The problem is sight, not light. The problem is sight, not light. Verse 33, there is enough light. There is plenty of light. God has given you a conscience. God has put his fingerprints all around the world in his creation. God has given us the Bible, 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. God has given us a map, M-A-P, 
manuscript evidence to show us that this is indeed the Word of God. We don't just take it on blind faith. Archaeology helps support that, supplement that. And prophecies, prophecies that have been fulfilled right on time as God has said, so, so much so that we can look ahead at the prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled. And there's such an impeccable track record that we know that God is a God who will not lie, who cannot lie. So God has given us much light. The problem is not the light. The problem is sight. The eye lets light into the mind. Now, if the eye is clear, if the eye is healthy, then what is really there in front of you will enter your mind through this portal called your eye and the appropriate effect will occur. Amazement, fear, perplexity, whatever that image was meant to evoke in you, it will evoke that in you if your eye is clear and it goes into your mind through your eye. But if the eye is blind, if the eye is blurred, then you could be looking at the Mona Lisa and yawn. You could be looking at all the treasures in the world and not have any effect upon you. Again, the problem is not the object. The problem is not the amount of light. The problem is our sight. I don't know if you've ever done any caving, but I have. And I'm a little claustrophobic, and, and I've been in a cave so deep that when you turn off your lamp, the blackness, the darkness feels heavy on you. It feels like a blanket. You know, you want to strike that match just to have a little bit of reprieve. Well, imagine if you're in a cave and they say that you spend enough time in that amount of darkness and you will go blind. So let's say that that's happened. You're in a cave two miles underground, pitch black, and you're blind. And a friend who is with you says, we have struck gold. We have arrived. All the treasure that we could spend in 10,000 lifetimes is right in front of us. Now that doesn't really impact you because you're blind and you're in darkness. So what would need to happen is not only the light, let's say he struck a match, lit a torch, and said, don't you see? And you say, no, I'm sorry, I don't see anything. Did you just strike a match? It smells like you did, but I can't tell. So you would not only need light, but you would need sight. God has furnished the light. And God alone can make the blind see. We are dependent upon him from start to finish. He is the God who not only raises the dead, he is the God who not only was raised from the dead, but he is the God who gives sight to blind people. Now, lest you think, oh, okay, so it, it's his job to just make my eyes right, so I will eat, drink, and be merry, and, and it's his job. I love how the Bible is so balanced. Look at verse 35, another one of those commandments. I told you there's three commandments in this passage. Then watch out. Literally, take care that your eyes are good. Remove any hindrances from your eyes. So this keeps us from being fatalists. This keeps us from just sitting back and going, well, it's God's job to cause these blind eyes to see, so I'm just going to go and live my life and sow my oats and live for me and live for me until God changes me. That's what the Bible refers to as foolishness. You have a role to play. Literally, this commandment puts the ball in your court. It says, watch out. Take 
care that your eyes are not bad, but good. If by the grace of God, listen to me, I'm almost done. If by the grace of God, you respond obediently to the light that you have been given, God will graciously give you more light. Let me say that one more time. If by the grace of God, and we have to say that because it's all grace. If by the grace of God, you respond obediently to the light that you've been given, God will give you more light. But if you don't, as these in verses 29 through 36 did not, then your condemnation will be steeper, more harsh than if you had never heard at all. So what can we do? He says, keep watch, look out, make sure that your eyes are healthy. What can you do? I close with this. Let me give you some practical rubber meets the road instruction. Number one, pray for eyesight. And not with these eyes, but with these. There's a lot of scripture that backs this up. Ephesians 1 is a great one. Ephesians 3 is a great one. I like Psalm 119 verse 18 where the psalmist says, Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. You say, but you're a Christian, aren't you, Pastor Brent? Well, I am. But I still get junk in my eyes. I still get narcissistic and take my eyes off of Jesus and off of the true meaning of the text, and I put it on myself and what I want the text to say. So this is a good reminder that even Christians and certainly unbelievers need the Lord need the Holy Spirit to open us up so that we can see what's really there. Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. Number two, I'm just going to point you back to verse 31 and 32, those, those words, behold. Dig. Search. Set your alarm clock 15 minutes early if you say, I just don't have time to read my Bible. Go to bed 15 minutes later. Be like a friend of mine who set his watch so that once every hour it went off and that just was a reminder to him to stop what he was doing and take two minutes to pray and seek the Lord. Exhaust yourself exploring the inexhaustible Christ. You will not regret it. If this man in Kansas City could read the Bible with his tongue, what about you? What about me? And then lastly, and I'm quoting Kent Hughes here. He says, we must be men and women who confess our sins regularly and ask God to keep our eye clear. Jesus' contemporaries could not see his radiant light and were missing the sign of Jonah because of a developed state. Surface confession had brought them to ignore the inconsistencies of their heart. They had squelched their burning consciences until they were desensitized. If the light is to shine in our souls, there must be regular confession, deep confession, followed by passionately asking God to flood our eyes with light. He says we must take time to be alone with God, to meditate on His Word. We must ask ourselves, is the light in me actually darkness? And we must make every effort to see to it that is not. That one kind of caught me off guard. We must ask the Lord, is the light in me actually darkness? That's what this group thought. Look at verse 35 again. Watch out that the light in you is not darkness. In other words, the scribes and Pharisees, if you had hooked them up to a lie detector test, if they had such a thing back in that day, and said, do you love God? Yes, yes. They passed the test. Are you going to heaven when you die? Yes, 
and they passed the test. They so believed that what they believed was right <laughs> that when Jesus taught the opposite, they just ignored it. Said, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm full of light, they would say. But the light in them was actually darkness. The most dangerous place to be is a heartbeat from hell. And you think you're a heartbeat from heaven. So what must you do to make sure your eyes are clear and healthy and seeing what's really there? Pray. Ask the Lord. Open my eyes. Open my heart. Uh, number two, read and dig and explore and explore and explore some more. And number three, confess your sins daily, deeply. Have the courage to say, Lord, if I'm deceived in any area of my life, thinking that I am A-OK, -okay, but by your standard I am not, would you show me that while there is time to repent and believe? Let's pray together. Father, you have given us so much light today. Thank you. Thank you for not leaving us in the darkness. Church, I, I want to ask you, will you respond in repentance towards God and in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a faith that obeys. Will you respond this morning in worship to your Lord? Trust, amazement towards the Christ of Scripture. Jesus deserves this. Jesus demands this. There's a promise for those who do. There is joy and delight. There is peace, as Travis read the scripture this morning. There is peace now and for all of eternity. But if you are here this morning and you have not repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, if you have not worshipped him, despite the light that he has given you this morning, then there is judgment, and it is real. And even Ninevites who repented and believed, even the queen of Sheba who repented and believed, under far less favorable conditions than you, will rise up and shame you and build an airtight argument against you that you were foolish to not take hold of Christ while you could. What are you waiting on? What more could he say? So Lord Jesus, we ask all of this in your precious, sweet Sovereign name, God's people said, Amen. Amen.